question is, uh, how many of you here have read my book? <laughs> okay. All right, that's okay, that's okay. You will be after this. Um, all right, so one of the things that I, a uh, lot of the questions that I was being asked when I was writing the book and after it was published is, what's the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? So I, I just thought I would give a really quick overview and um, some examples from my book. So here's the main difference. It's really quite simple. Publishers differentiate between memoir and autobiography by the timeline covered in the writing. So let me explain this to you. So an autobiography focuses on the chronology of the writer's entire life, while a memoir covers one specific aspect of the writer's life. So if I chose to write about my complete life up to this point, including growing up in Livermore and the Bay Area during the late 50s and 60s, yes, I am that old, <laughs> the two years aboard our schooner, moving to Colorado mountains to ski, decades spent in New York City traveling the world as a model, time spent performing as an improv and commercial actor, becoming a studio goldsmith, leaving New York City, starting a family late in life, I have a 17-year-old, uh, renovating an 1880s barn, surviving two hurricanes in Florida, and after three careers publishing my first book, I'd write an autobiography. However, if I chose to write about a specific event, about a two-year voyage aboard my family's home-built schooner heritage, sailing down the Central American coast as a 16-year-old, navigating my way from adolescence to adulthood under extraordinary circumstances, replete with family drama, leaking vessels, hurricanes, fire, and a coterie of characters, I'd write a memoir. And that is what Unmoored is about. So, one of the things that uh, was so wonderful about writing this is that I realized that everyone in the world has a story. And I believe that everyone, if you have the chance, whether it's to publish a book or just write a legacy for your family, should, should write either an autobiography or a memoir. So these are just a few things about uh, tips for writing a story any of you ever become interested, or your children or your grandchildren say, hey, you know, what was it like when you were young? <laughs> so, um, uh, I, although I'm not reading from the actual chapter one, when, when it says open with dramatic moment, I am going to read from chapter 16, where we encounter a hurricane. In the time it took to wrest the Genoa out of the water and lash it down, the dusky sky turned a greenish hue, and the wind whistled an eerie tune. A storm was approaching. Safely in the cockpit with the rest of my family, I thought about the weather and a game my sisters and I used to play in the barn in Livermore. We memorized nautical rhymes in anticipation of one day sailing the ocean. I recall the one I liked best, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. But realized that my father's favorite, mares, tails, and mackerel scales, make tall ships take in their sails, was the one we should have heeded. It was now apparent to all of us the high cirrus clouds that had formed earlier in the day had given us fair warning. Bear cold and engine roaring, heritage turned seaward. As Isla Grande fell astern and a starless night enveloped us, the seas mounted. When the first line of squalls hit and the troughs turned deep and far apart, we realized it was too late to turn around and head back north and impossible to head seaward and wait it out. We're gonna have to wait and make it to see what nail, girls, before the weather turns any worse, my father said. 
Aware his initial decision to avoid a night entry had resulted in two alternative and ultimately, ultimately unsuccessful actions, we understood the gravity and risk. I suddenly thought about Joe Eklund, and for the first time, worried that maybe the reason we hadn't heard from him was that he'd faced a storm like this. What if Joe, who'd made several transatlantic crossings from Norway and was a seasoned sailor, had forged ahead in bad weather, as we were doing, but had not made it? I tried not to think about the possibility, because compared to him, we had no business out here in rough weather. To calm myself, I imagined Joe anchored in a warm, safe cove somewhere south of us, throwing back a beer and chatting with his pet parrot. With each plunge forward, the weather worsened. Heritage was now sliding down each trough with increasing speed and making a slow, hellish climb back to the top while we sat terrified, anticipating it happening all over again. Shackling ourselves to the lifeline, we huddled in the cockpit in our, in our harnesses and float coats. My mother gripped Nancy with all her might, and Pam, Gail, and I grabbed each other. With his face lit by the binnacle's red light, my father rode the helm like a possessed cowboy. The seas raged all around us, and he gripped the wheel as if seated on a wild bull that wanted nothing more than to buck and stomp the living daylights out of him. Looks like we're in for a full-blown chabasco, he shouted above the sound of the screaming wind and churning waves. Little did he know this was nothing compared to what lay ahead in the rising black seas. Plummeting like a stone, the boat dropped with such speed there was no time to look around and figure out what was happening. My peripheral vision narrowed until the only thing I could see was my father's unlit wet cigarette hanging from the corner of his mouth. Heritage smashed and hit bottom, shuddering from bow to stern as she struggled to climb back up. Against the blackness, a bright white luminescent line of phosphorescence appeared, and just before Heritage reached the top, the wave broke and crested over the bowsprit. Water tore along the decks and cabin top in an avalanche of spray drenching us and filling the cockpit. There was no time to react before Heritage began her next wild descent, smashing and shuddering before climbing again. The troughs were increasing in length, and the climb back up them was longer, so when Heritage had only made it two-thirds of the way up, we could see the phosphorescence forming. Oh my God, my mother cried, shielding Nancy. We watched the wave crest and race toward us, it roared along the cabin top, under the main boom and over the dodger, smashing into my father with such force that it pushed him back against the stern railing. He slid back up on the seat and lunged for the wheel, catching his breath. No sooner had he taken control of the helm than we dropped again, so fast and precipitous, it was only when we looked up could we understand the enormity of what was happening. We had stalled at the very bottom of the trough. Too terrified to even cry out, we watched the top of the wave crest. Hold on, my father yelled. I closed my eyes and waited to hear the splitting of timber and the sound of the mast crashing onto the cabin top and deck. When I opened my eyes, I saw a wall of water, its phosphorescent crest frothing and foaming like a rabid animal. I instinctively ducked, pressing against my sisters and mother. Water barreled headlong into us with such force that it lifted us off our seats. Heritage groaned under the weight of water submerging her stern. I was certain this was it, and that the next wave would sink us. But as Heritage's bow plunged down into the trough, the stern emptied, and we rose back up and over the next crest. Suddenly, we saw an offshore light in the distance. A few minutes later, a second one on shore was visible. As soon as they lined up, my father turned Heritage straight toward them. With all of us holding our breath, we approached the entrance, hoping to slip through before another wave struck. 
Heritage was finally inside the harbor. My father grabbed the flashlight and checked the navigation chart. With harbor depths recorded at several fathoms, we cautiously made our way in the dark until we reached the inner harbor. Just like Babe's letters had promised, we were in calm, protected waters. We motored slowly between the anchor lights of other boats, backing away just in time from an unlit trimaran. Clear of it, we set anchor, paying out plenty of chain. It was 2 a.m. Sleep deprived since departing Manzanillo and thoroughly spent, we stumbled below, making our way through the dark, dank cabin to our box. <laughs> I also narrated my book, so. Um, uh, and so the second thing about writing a successful memoir is that um, the, the rule is that you can be tough on real life characters in your book so long as you are tougher on yourself. So that's, that's the rule. Um, and it really helps if they are dead. So, <laughs> which, which, because it took me 50 years to write this, and uh, I just turned 70 in July, um, a lot of the uh, sailors that were much older than us have gone on to greener pastures, as my father would like to say. Um, so. This is um, when we uh, headed into Costa Rica. After a two-day trip, we entered the Gulf of Nicoya and anchored at Isla Jesusita. From the water's edge to the treetops, thick vines crisscrossed the island like a giant chartreuse spider web. And under its entanglement, we could hear the screeching of monkeys and parrots. Eager to get off the boat and explore, my sisters and I claimed first dibs on the dinghy. Don't fool around too long, my father said as we rowed away. Remember, other people want to get off this boat. No shit, I said under my breath. <laughs> You're lucky Dad didn't hear you. You think I care, I said. Pam may have established leverage with her Spanish, but I was confident no one would climb the mast fix a block, or hang from the bow during a storm to pull in a sail. It's not like he could kick me off the boat. Just try not to aggravate him, Pam said. He's already in a bad mood. He'd been out of sorts ever since he'd had to ration his smokes to two packs a day after discovering his low inventory. When he'd mentioned he couldn't believe he'd smoke that much, Pam and I assured him he had. At this rate, he groused, I'll have to load up with the local ones. I remembered Pam and I exchanging sidelong looks. We'd emptied so many Salem's overboard, we'd come dangerously close to getting caught. Looking at him from the safety of the dinghy, I thought, if he's this crabby about his cigarettes, how's he going to react when he discovers he only has one shoe? As I rode toward the island, the dinghy cut through the smooth, bottle-green surface as easily as a water strider on a pond. How I wished my father's acknowledgement of me could have been as easy. I'd proved my worth countless times under the most treacherous conditions, but his tirades of, quote, dealing with you goddamn women canceled the smallest of achievements. What difference did it make do, doing the work of a man if I never rose above the disappointment of being a girl? I thought things might change after Bahia Elena, where we'd had a wonderful time as a family. But when the initial shock of Joe's death wore off and we left Playa del Coco, he reverted right back to his old self. If I had to spend one more minute with him grouching, I swear I'll push him overboard, I said. Gail and Nancy were quiet, but Pam stifled a laugh. 
I looked at my older sister who sat facing me. We might not have, we might have had nothing in common, but the one thing we agreed on was how we felt about our captain. So, the next thing is the mistake that a lot of people write when they're, when they're writing something is they, and especially if it's, usually people write memoirs because they have experienced some sort of trauma. <laughs> because otherwise, you know, if you've had a perfect life, there's kind of nothing to write about. Um, but um, one thing that's really important is to balance out the trauma with humor. Um, so, since there's so much drama in my book. <laughs> Marveling over the Spanish, Spanish colonial architecture, this is when we, by the way, we entered uh, Mazapan. Uh, marveling over the Spanish colonial architecture with its vibrant, brightly painted buildings, we explored every shop and cobblestone street and strolled along the Malecon, Mazatlan's famous seafront walkway. Located off the main plaza, the central mercado offered everything from the mundane to the exotic. Carcasses of beef and plucked poultry hung alongside skinned iguanas, javelina, and snake. Bananas and oranges competed with mangoes, guavas, and guanamadas. And staples like tortillas and rice sat next, next to rich pastries and raw goat's milk. There was even an ice cream parlor where we ordered huge chocolate and vanilla cones. Pam, Gail, and I devoured ours before it all melted down our shirts. But Nancy was happy to spend the rest of the afternoon in her ice cream stained t-shirt sporting a Zabata-sized chocolate mustache. On our third day visiting town, my father took a different route back to the boat, convinced it was faster. Walking down a narrow street, we chanced upon a shoe shop selling harachis. My father, suddenly feeling generous, asked if we all wanted a pair. Ten minutes later, with tennis shoes in hand, we clomped down the street wearing our new donkey urine cured leather and tire soled sandals. What we didn't consider as we traversed the streets in our open toed shoes were the cockroaches that skittered about in the fading light. Annoyed by our continuous squealing and hopping, my father yelled, Knock it off! What are you, a bunch of scaredy cats? They're just bugs. They can't hurt you. As we made our way down the cobblestone street, the sun dropped like a brick, plunging us in darkness until we reached the dimly lit landing to the causeway. Without warning, Nancy raced over and crouched down under the light. Look, Daddy, it's a little crab. The creature was crawling sideways, like a crab, but had an, had an unusual black tail, which curved into a perfectly shaped C. As it moved toward her, it raised its tail as if to strike. Don't move, honey, my father said, and in a few quick strides scooped her up. That's no crab, Pam said. It's a scorpion. Holding Nancy in his arms, my father led the sprint down the rest of the way until we reached the well-lit causeway. Rowing back in our dinghy, we noticed a double-ender like Mamusa had arrived and was anchored between us and the Frasers. No lights were on, so we figured we'd have to wait till morning to meet them. But after we were aboard and below, we heard splashing and laughter. Surprised anyone would swim at this late hour, we scrambled up to the cockpit. Sure enough, reflected by the full moon, four heads bobbed in the water. Two more figures teetered on the newly arrived boat's railing, ready to leap. Hey, I wouldn't get in the water if I were you, I called out. Oh yeah, one of them said. It was a man's voice, slurred and whiskey thick. Unless, of course, you want to walk around like a pirate, I said. The second voice, high-pitched and female, tittered. 
What did she mean, Roger? Nothing to worry or then think about, my wee lass, her companion replied, in what he must have thought sounded like the perfect Sean Connery Scottish accent. Oh, Roger, she giggled and jumped. What my daughter was trying to say is the harbor's not a place you want to swim in, my father said. Thanks, Captain. We'll take that into consideration. Ignoring my father's warning, the man called Roger sang out, Ready or not, girls, here I come. And belly flopped into the water to the delight of five squealing women. Let's go below, girls, my father said, pissed that his friendly warning had gone unheeded. As Pam and Gail started down the companion, I couldn't help but get in one last jab. I leaned over the railing and said in a loud voice, Hey, Dad, here come the sharks. I can see their fins in the moonlight. Smiling, I settled back in the cockpit as the screams of six swimmers filled the night air. Not funny, young lady, my father said, poking his head out of the companionway. What, I asked. I was telling the truth. There were sharks in the harbor. I just didn't clarify they'd already been fed. After the anglers departed, the crews cut up and disposed of the day's catch. But instead of dumping the remains on the other side of the breakwater, they dumped them in the harbor. The bloody chum created a veritable feeding frenzy. The next day, Roger, obviously not one to hold a grudge, invited all of us on board to show off his expensive toy. He introduced us to his all-female crew, Bonnie, Debbie, Shirley, Susie, and Patsy, as if he were a farmer showing off his prized heifers. Roger's girls, as we dubbed them later, stood placidly by greeting us with open-eyed, bovine stares and wide smiles. In our estimation, all five would have not had, would have would not have won blue ribbons at the fair. But they, along with Roger, seemed oblivious to any deficiency. This amazed us since we were a family whose sole purpose was to point out even the most minuscule defects to one another. Roger was balding, with a forehead shaped like a dinosaur egg and an ego to match. Bonnie had acne. Debbie had miles of cellulite. Shirley had a nose shaped like an eagle's beak. Susie had enormous, pendulous boobs. And Patsy looked like a man. Roger considered them great beauties. They worshipped him as if he were 007. I just sit back and relax and give the helm to Susie, Roger said. Did you know she graduated with top honors from the Coast Guard Academy in Texas, he bragged to us. Why, Susie could captain one of those commercial ships that pass us and dock at the lagoon. Shirley's the best chef and could cook up any dish I request. Studied at one of the greatest culinary schools in Paris. Bonnie and Patsy take care of all the boat work. Daddy can speak fluent Spanish. Got the perfect crew, I do, that's for sure. If they do all that, what do you do? All the women looked at him and then at each other before they burst out laughing. Roger just smiled. The next day, Roger and his girls weighed anchor, heading for the South Pacific, where my sisters and I assumed he'd continue to keep his crew giggling and satisfied. Although it was probably the last we'd ever see of them, they left an indelible impression. We learned that somewhere in the world, there's someone for everyone. And sometimes, there's more than someone for everyone. <laughs> Even though Pam, Gail, and I snickered over this and enjoyed the discomfort our parents displayed when pressed to explain Roger's unusual setup, it was a lesson that happiness could be found in the doing and not, like us, in the pursuing where it always seemed to be just beyond our reach. So that's a little bit of kind of a taste of my book. <laughs> um, do any of you have any questions or 
things that you would like to I'm, yes. So I'm a reader of your Bible. You have so much detail about the beauty and every single place you went. How much of your book writing was research to write all that beautiful description stuff you wrote? Well, believe it or not, um, a lot of it is from memory. I mean, I wrote a journal. I always, I always had a journal that I wrote on the trip. But also, um, so, you know, I started this book. This book kind of had like stops and starts over the decades. And um, when I first started it and, and kind of wrote a really, really rough outline, you know, maybe 40 or 50 pages, um, it was before the internet. <laughs> and so uh, it actually was kind of good because I had to uh, research it through all of the secondhand bookstores, like Powell Books, I think is located up in Portland, and a lot of books. And um, so I have a whole library of books that were written in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, because the interesting thing about, and I'll show you some pictures, is how much, how, how barren and pristine Baja California and the Mexican coast were. And it is so different now. So it was really important that I be as authentic um, as possible. So um, once I had that, it was interesting when you look at the pic you look at pictures and you say, oh, oh my gosh, I remember that. Um, and then, uh, I allowed myself, as Stephen King likes to say in his book on writing, uh, write everything you can possibly think of. So my first draft was 750 pages, because there was a lot that happened in those two years. <laughs> and, um, and so, but it's, it, you know, once you kind of, uh, you look at that and you, and you edit it down, um, but, I'm sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, it just was so oh, about, about, the, about the, about the, about, so, no, whatever. so my older sister um, was a professional writer her whole life and editor. And so when I, uh, by the way, I got permission from my family to write this story. And uh, so it was fantastic that, first of all, she was a professional writer and editor, um, and that she was on the trip. And so I would write something, and it would jog her memory, and then it would jog my memory, and she'd say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's, yes, that happened. So it was really great to know that, yes, indeed, it wasn't just something I was making up in my mind, but that it actually happened. So I was lucky that way, because I don't know if everybody has that opportunity when they're writing um, to have somebody who was actually on the trip um, with them. So yes, that's how, that's how that happened. Um, and you know, this is a, um, this trip was something that we talked about in our family when, after we were all adults and we would get together during the holidays, it was always the trip. And as my nephews in the front row can attest to, they, they got pretty tired of us talking about, remember when this happened and dad said this and mom did that, you know. And, so um, he's very happy that I wrote this book, so I don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, we may have missed this because you got in about five minutes late, but how did you handle your offshore navigation? Uh, well, my father had a famous um, saying that um, he used to navigate with one foot on the beach. <laughs> so, so to sailors, that is like, what? You know, I've, I've had, it's very interesting because I've had, I've had, the, my readers have been so varied. I thought I was just going to appeal to a certain group of people. And so I have had professional sailors read the book and I'm like, what was your father? Thank you. You know? And so, we have to look within the context of the time. Yes, if my father, took, if I were 16 now, and not 70, and my father said, yeah, let, let's you know, sail down the Mexican coast and you know, go around the world or wherever we end up, 
and he ha and he flunked celestial navigation, I would say, no way, Jose. I'm not going anywhere with you. Which is what my daughter, who's 17, would say. Um, but this was in the 60s. And, you know, my parents were of a generation where, I mean, even though women's lib was starting to, you know, be, come into being, it, it, we still had a very traditional household. So this was a huge dream of my father's. I mean, I can give like a little, just a slight background. It's not in the book. It's actually in my second book. But um, my, my mother worked for, uh, at the time it was called Morris Radiation Lab, and I believe it's called Livermore Lab, is that yes. what it's called? Yeah, Livermore Lab. Yeah, and my dad worked for Sandia Corporation, and he got the opportunity as a civilian engineer to uh, uh, go over to Anahuitoc in the South Pacific for 18 months. And uh, so, you know, when he came back, you know, he had been, for 18 months, he had been sitting on the beach looking at the stars, you know, thinking about, oh, you know, what I want to do with my life. <laughs> and when he came back, you know, he had sailed on the Great Lakes as a teenager. He grew up in Chicago. And so he kind of always had this dream, but then when he was over in Anahuitoc, and, you know, besides watching the atomic bombs go off, um, sitting on the beach with their Mai Tais um, and little, what do you call them, those similar badges. <clears throat> he, um, it, you know, it was, it's beautiful there. And, but he had three, at the time he had three little girls and a wife. So, um, you know, that, that's how he came about having this huge dream. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people say, oh, your father was such a Captain Bly and stuff. But I, but I also know that my father was, it was pretty amazing that he could build a boat with his bare hands and, and he had a dream, you know, he had a, he had a big dream. So um, what he wanted to do, we just went along, you know. And there was always the promise of, I know I'm kind of tough on you girls now, but wait till the trip starts, you know, I'll be a different man, I'll be a different father. And anybody who sailed here knows that um, uh, unless you have the personality in the first place, um, all sailing does when you're out in the ocean is kind of exaggerate, you know, what you are on land. So if you're like kind of a stressful guy, you know, um, the responsibility of four little girls and, and a wife who knows nothing, doesn't know a flat edge from a Phillips screwdriver, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's rough. But we never questioned it, you know, we didn't question it. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's the con within the context of, of the times. I hope that answers your question. Piggyback on Yes, yeah, yeah. There were definitely there were people um, who had bigger budgets, <laughs> and so they had radar. Um, so yes, we would piggyback uh, behind them when we got caught in fog um, and almost ran up on the beach. Um, so yeah, there were times when we did it, and then there were times like in the hurricane where we were on our own. Yes. How much sailing experience did your family have before they embarked on this trip? <laughs> That's why this looks so funny. <laughs> so I didn't read that part of my book, but um, so when we we left San Francisco in December of 1969, my father was smart enough to have two professional sailors or let's put it this way, so-called professional sailors. Um, uh, and they were supposed to sail down to San Diego with us. Um, but uh, with all the issues, they, they happened to leave in Monterey. But um, we, say, we had one sailing experience to Sausalito <laughs> before we left. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I say it's a very funny book. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What was the draft of the boat? 
uh, over six feet. So that was also one of the criticisms that my, my dad received um, once we hit mm, Costa Rica. There was a very famous sailing couple, the Parties, Lynn and Larry Party. I'm sure people who are sailors, they're being inducted into the Hall of Fame uh, this year. Larry, of course, um, died in 2020. Um, and I'm pretty rough on them in the book, but then I'm 16, so I feel like I can be. Um, and uh, just, you know, uh, I did correct myself in my author's note saying, uh, yeah, even though I thought Larry was a pain in the ass, <laughs> and so was Lynn, um, you know, I give them their due credit. So, um, but Larry, that was the first thing Larry said was, what are you doing sailing in the tropics with a Gloucester, you know, gaff rig schooner meant for um, sailing off Nova Scotia? So, <laughs> um, but my father was a dreamer and he was a romantic. And, you know, for all the faults that Heritage displayed, she was a beautiful boat. So, um, and she is actually um, basically the third main character in my book. So, you know, the main characters are, are me and my father and Heritage. So, because we had to compete with her. So, yes? Where is Heritage today? Well, that kind of spoils the ending of the book. <laughs> And then you won't buy my book, so or or or, or take it out of the library. Okay. Let me ask you another question. Uh, what's the demise of your father? What's the demise? Okay, so I can tell you that, even though it's in my second book that I'm writing, my father passed away uh, two years after um, our trip ended. Yeah. So he he uh, was only 47, and. Um, Kind of the big joke in our family is, uh, we have a macabre sense of humor, by the way, um, is that my mother uh, was almost twice the age he was when he passed away. Um, so basically, she got the last laugh. <laughs> uh, do you have a picture of? I, uh, so I'm, I'm going to just now show you guys. Oh. And if and when you read my book, um, there is a big fire in the book. And so I'm going to show you the, the only remaining photos that we took because obviously there was no such thing as GoPros and iPhones. You know, let me take a picture. We just had film. And one of the things that my mother did when we reached uh, Costa Rica we had about 15, 20 rolls of film, and she thought, oh, I don't want to get them developed here. You know, I'm going to send them back to Burbank, California. And they never made it. So, oh, no. so, uh, so this, this is the barn that is no longer there, opposite the Concannon Winery on South Livermore Avenue. And people used to, they couldn't believe their eyes, you know, especially when. <coughs> when we had to take off the front, and people would drive by and they were like, oh, did, did I drink too much last night? And uh, I guess they could have said that I smoked too much last night, because it was the 60s, but a little bit. Um, and these are the Livermore Hills here. Um, and so here, they had to drag, the boat, drag Heritage out, getting it ready for the trailer, for the 18-wheeler. There we are on I-580, going out of Livermore. We did have some problems. We, we uh, uh, cut a lot of uh, power lines and telephone lines, much to the chagrin of people in Livermore who hated our guts and didn't even know who we were. So, the power, so we had to wait a weekend. Uh, so the boat sat in Livermore in a parking lot for the weekend. Uh, but then the power company came out and helped us get through, uh, get through town. This is at the Alameda Marina um, with a traveling uh, crane. Um, and here we're getting ready to launch. Uh, this is the author with her little braids. Mm -hmm. Born until I was, I don't know, 14. 
um, and um, my younger sister Gail. There are my parents. <clears throat> One thing that's very funny about this, um, as any of you who are sailors and have christened your boat, one of the worst things you can do is not smash the bottle on the first time. <laughs> and my mother didn't smash the bottle on the first time. <laughs> so we didn't know that that was a foreboding thing <laughs> when we left. And my father was like, just break the damn thing. <laughs> so she really swung hard. Um, this is the happy future crew members. There's me on the right and Gail on the left. I, I'm, I'm much happier now. I just want you to realize that. Um, this is uh, what uh, Heritage looked like when we were getting ready, uh, 1969. So we moved on board. We sold our house in the uh, Oakland Hills in Montclair, where we live. Um, oh, by the way, my, a lot of people have asked me, well, wait a minute, I don't understand. It was 1969 when the boat was launched. And then you left in, I mean, 1963, in 1969 when you left, like, well, what, what happened during, during all those, how long did it take to get ready? Well, um, my younger sis, youngest sister came along, and my father did not want diapers flapping on the lifelines. So he decided, uh, I think I'll just wait a little while, and I'll go look for an empty lot in the Oakland Hills, and um, I'll just build a house while we're waiting. So he and our friend, who, Joe Eklund, who is in the book, um, was a fellow sailor. And he and my dad built our, our A-frame in the Oakland Hills in six months. Um, and we, I, I spent uh, junior high, the three years of junior high. So, and one year of, uh, one year of, uh, at that time, it was, uh, Senior high started sophomore, junior, and senior. There was only three years of, uh, of senior high, and our my older sister Pam had already graduated. Um, and here's another shot. Okay, so here's the crew. This is us when we left on the trip, and a lot of people say, "What? <laughs> Your father left with a four-year-old? That's Gail on the right, top right, thirteen. That's yours truly, right here on the left." and my older sister Pam. This is the cook and captain, because that's what my mother was. She was not a sailor, and uh, after two years before the mast, was still a cook. She wasn't much of a cook. <laughs> no, 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 she wasn't much of a cook. <laughs> chipped beef. I'll never eat another <laughs> thing of chipped beef as long as I live. And I'm really not partial to oatmeal anymore. <laughs> Um, and this is just a sh one of the rare shots we have. Sailing off of, uh, this was in Costa Rica in 1970, and that's the youngest right there in an inner tomb. Who's now a gorgeous woman sitting there. Um, and that, these are our, uh, some traveling boats that we traveled with, um, partially down the coast. Basically hippies on the left, and um, and, I don't know, crazy people on the right. <laughs> um, and in the book, you know, this doesn't have much meaning to you now, but this up here, I don't know how to do this pointer. <coughs> anyway, this up here, um, they were a great couple. Um, Max and Muggs Fraser lived in Tiburon, California. And Max always had a, he owned a furniture company, and he always had a dream of sailing to the South Pacific. So um, we, we knew about them in San Diego, but we met them in Mazatlan, and they were a fantastic couple. Very funny, uh, wonderful. I learned a lot, you know, because this is a coming of age book, and I, I learned a lot from Mubs and Max. Kind of how to be instead of how not to be. They were very relaxed sailors. Um, these uh, over to the right, that's my dad and my sister Kate. Um, and uh, the, that's a mother and son, Hilka, who was probably well into her 70s. 
and um, John, and, and to the right is Shotzi. He plays a part in the book, too. And they had a, a Siamese cat named Tinkerbell. And they were better sailors than we were. <laughs> Didn't get sick, not once. Um, and they were missionaries, and they, um, we met them in Mexico, and they sailed to, uh, where were they? In uh, somewhere in the South Pacific. Um, and they um, opened a missionary there. And um, this is Laddie, and when you read the book, Laddie is a real character, and um, she also taught us about women's lib, and how to be really strong, and it was okay to be opinionated. It maybe took me a couple decades to understand that, but um, when I started writing about her, I was like, yeah, she got it like all those years ago. Um, I wanted to show this picture. This is taken um, uh, from a book. Um, this, this is taken in 1976. But I wanted to show this just, this is Cabo San Lucas. Okay, now, I don't know if any of you have been to Cabo San Lucas. Um, I went back, I had, uh, they used to do uh, modeling shoots there because of the weather and, and you know, just the, ambiance of it, so I got a chance to go back in like, I think 2017 or maybe even earlier, and it, of course, looks nothing like this. Um, so this is another picture, and this is exactly, we were there in 1970, so that's what it looked like when we went into the harbor. So you can see how progress has altered everything. Um, so was it, it was a different experience. That's me, water skiing, and that's Laddie's and Tony's boat. They had a steel uh, catch, um, it was like 56 feet, um, that's in the book. And this is in Punta Arenas with our wonderful pilot who promptly drove us up on a sandbar. <laughs> and um, my father was going crazy and he, was, he told us in Spanish, Ah, we have to wait until the tide comes in, and so now it's time for lunch. <laughs> so so uh, we had to wait until until the boat lifted off, uh, lifted off, and put the race. And that's the captain in a rare moment of repose. And that's it. Yes. Um, I spent a little time on a boat, and I was really. Um, really impressed by the community it forms with people on boats and but I didn't see very many kids. Did you meet other families when you were Well so that that's an interesting question. So um, in nineteen sixty nine we were quite well known. We we're almost like celebrities because very, very few families uh, cruised. I'm not saying they didn't sail, like sail the bay or, you know, day sail or whatever, but very few families. Uh, and so, you know, the irony of all this is that my father was like, oh, I'm going to get these, you know, we grew up in uh, Livermore when we were younger, and then in Oakland uh, when we were going to junior high and high school. And my, you know, during that time, it was like the Berkeley riots and summer of love, you know. And all of that, my father was like, I'm getting these kids out of here. Um, and the, the irony is that the bulk of cruising, the cruising community, were all single guys who were in their early 20s. A heyday for us, <laughs> but, you know, a pain in the ass for my father. So, um, yeah, he, he actually got his just rewards a little bit. Um, um, but, um, yeah, so there were very few families. It, you know, I follow now so many young couples that are on YouTube, you know, um, what do you call them, not Instagram, uh, um, Influent, thank you, thank you. I have to turn to somebody who's 30 years younger than I am. Um, influencers, um, you know, who are on their 75 foot, you know, trimaran, you know, with, what's that, carbon hold, you know, amazing boat. And they have their two little toddlers, and, 
you know, they've got their drones, you know, taking and they're, they're editing their videos that look like, uh, you know, unbelievable uh, uh, movies. Um, and it really looks like the good life, and they have every electronic device possible on the boat. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's wonderful, but it's, it wasn't our reality, you know. And I frankly think, you know, our reality made for a more interesting story. Because, I mean, if you have incredible electronic equipment where you have, a, you know, you're saying, like they just had in the news the other day, I think they were going to cross the Atlantic, and they weren't really exactly sure, but they think that whale hit them. And they sank in 45 minutes. And fortunately, the people that were on board were, were seasoned sailors, and, you know, they had enough, um, you know, in their frame of mind, they were able to grab what they needed to grab and throw their inflatable, you know, tented, uh, you know, we had a dinghy. You know, we had a, a, a we had something where you had to blow it up. You know, <laughs> like you do in the airlines, and um, and they threw a beacon over, and in nine hours, the ship, the, the closest ship, was able to rescue them. So, uh, if that had happened to us, it would have been sayonara. So, um, yeah, it was a different uh, a different time. Um, and so I'm glad we did it. You know, a lot of people ask me. You know, it was crazy, why, you know, do you regret it? And it's like, no, because it gave me a lot of grit and determination, so, you know. yes? Now, did you have a ham radio on board? We had a radio, but it rarely worked, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, another, another question, uh, you now have a 17-year-old, it sounds like. Yes. Uh, how, uh, how are your parenting skills? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gee, I was just talking to my sister about that today. Uh, a good until she was about 13. So, um, but uh, I think they're pretty good. I think they're pretty good. I mean, I don't ex I don't, I didn't mirror my father, you know, even though I feel like uh, in my future careers and, you know, clients I handled and, um, you know, I look back and all of that, all of that kind of, those challenges really helped me. Um, I also think that in today's world it's kind of unnecessary to be that way, you know. So, you know, could I be, could I have been a little tougher on my kid? Maybe so. But, you know, I'm not a helicopter parent, so. Yes? Do you, uh, Sail? Uh, still sail today, or uh, been sailing? Gee, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, so, after the trip, I became an expert skier. That answers your question. <laughs> uh, but I have, uh, I have sailed in the Caribbean. I've sailed on the East Coast. I've sailed um, in the Bay um, occasionally. Um, I haven't done any, you know, long. Distance, uh, you know, across the Atlantic with this one gentleman over here who sailed the Atlantic. Um, I was slated to actually, um, and it had to do with um, my acting background. Uh, there was a famous uh, sailor named Tony Bullimore. He was uh, British, and um, I shot a commercial with him. And uh, he asked me. Uh, he sailed trimarans, and he was going for the world record. And we were slated to go around the horn, um, and then funding fell through. But I'm kind of glad I didn't do that because um, I'm not sure I'd be standing here today talking to you. So. <laughs> yes. Did you ever overload after this trip, or did you just go with other people or that? Uh, no, I never owned a boat, but I. I believe that I should be in the Guinness Book of World Records because um, uh, I helped build a boat and then take it apart. And of course, I can't elaborate any more on that because then it spoils things. But uh, uh, no, I, 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 I learned through our family that 
uh, and any sailor knows this, that when you own a boat, it's like you're taking a whole stack of money and throwing it <laughs> overboard. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, very expensive. And also, uh, I didn't, at, at that point in my life, in my early 20s and 30s, uh, I wanted to um, travel the world. And I didn't want to be held down by, you know, owning a, a weekend house or, or anything like that. So I got to travel the world, which was great. Okay. Okay, well, thank you thank to the author so J.R. Russell. So thank you so much. Oh,